Today's daf is Samech Hey. We're going to start at the top of Samech Hey Amud Aleph. Second line. So I talked about things that the woman can wear when she goes out into the Rishut Rabim, into the public domain. One of them was if she wants to put some kind of a, uh, an absorbent cloth into her ear to collect... Um, whatever excretions come from the ear, this would apply to a man as well as a woman. It's not just a woman, just that since, it, since the parak started speaking about a woman, it sort of continues with that, but it could be the same. For anybody who wants to put something cotton in their ear, whatever it is, to uh, soak up whatever excreting, is excreting from there. So, Tanei Rami Bar Yechezkel, Rami Bar Yechezkel said, This is on the condition that it's somehow tied to the ear. In other words, you can't just put something that might fall out, because if it falls out, then she may carry it, and that would be a problem. And similarly, we said in the second, uh, further on in the Mishnah, she can put in her shoe some kind of a pad or something to make it more comfortable for her. And again, it has to be tied to the sandal. In other words, it has to be affixed so that it doesn't fall off and she doesn't end up carrying it. The poskim say that nowadays we have closed shoes. We don't have open sandals. So open sandals, it was a concern that it could fall out. Now you have a closed shoe. It can't fall out. If you put something in the heel of the shoe, it's not going to fall out. So it would be okay. Our shoes, putting something, inserting something in the heel of your shoe is the same as tying it because our shoes are enclosed around the foot and it will hold anything you put in place. Similarly, if a woman has a feminine product that she uh, puts during her uh, period so that it will collect the, uh, so it will collect the blood and, and will not make, uh, make a mess. So, so again, Rami Bar Chama, just like Rami Bar Yechezkel has been telling us that all of these other pads or whatever they are in the ear and on the foot have to be tied or affixed in place in order to be allowed to be worn on Shabbat. Similarly, the feminine uh, product should have to be tied in place. So how do we know that that's not the case? So the Amar Rava, Rava says, that since this is something that is unpleasant and disgusting, in other words, putting something in your ear, a piece of cotton, if it falls out, you could carry it. Put something on your foot, you know, you could carry it. But something that is collecting the uh, drippings of blood, nobody's going to want to carry that in the Rishut HaRabim. If it falls out, it falls out. So we don't require it to be tied or taped or affixed to the woman in any way. Rabbi Yirmi asked Rabbi Abba, Asetalak bet yad mahu. What if this particular item that she is using for her nida for a period has a handle on it? So she doesn't actually have to touch the part that's bloody. She can touch a part that's clean. He said still, Amarle Mutar said it's still permitted. The reason why it's permitted is because the item itself is something that's unpleasant and, uh, and is, is not something someone would want to carry around in the public domain. So, Itmar was stated similarly, that even if there is a handle on it, it's still permitted to be carried. We're not just concerned that she won't want to carry it because she doesn't want to touch it. We're saying she's not going to want to carry it because it's something people don't want to look at. So she's not going to want to carry it around with her even if she has a handle by which to hold it. Rabbi now it says, Rabbi Yochanan, Now obviously it doesn't mean that Rabbi Yochanan was wearing a feminine product because Rabbi Yochanan was a man. What it means is that going back to the earlier case of the ear, putting something in the ear, he went to the Beit Midrash with something in his ear and he did not tie it to his ear. This, and we're going with Rashi's explanation. He quotes another explanation that's different, but we're going to go with Rashi, which is that he put the cotton in his ear, but he didn't tie it to his ear. He just walked to the Beit Midrash with it in his ear. The Chalukin alav chaverav, and his friends, his colleagues, disagreed with him and said that that was wrong. Rabbi Yanai nafik bo lekarmelit the Chalukin alav kol doro. Rabbi Yanai would put something in his ear to collect the wax or whatever it is that would excrete from there. And his friends, his entire generation opposed him, even though he only wore it to the Carmelite. Rabbi Yochanan would wear it even into the public domain to go to the Beit Midrash. Rabbi Yanai would just wear it into the Carmelite, in other words, into a place which wasn't exactly the public domain, but was sort of like, you know, his backyard, his front yard, whatever it was. And still his entire generation opposed it. They said in order to wear something in your ear, it has to be tied to your ear. You can't have something that might fall out and you might come to carry. Va'atani Rabbi Bar Yechezkel didn't Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Yechezkel say that it has to be tied to your ear? So how can Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yanai go against everybody? 
and put it in their ear without tying it. The answer is The answer is that they said that's only when it's loose. When something is loose and it might fall out, then you need to tie it. But our cotton or whatever we're putting in our ear, we're putting it in really tightly. And because it's placed really tightly, it's, it's not mobile. It's not something that's going to fall out. We're not concerned that it's going to fall out. And therefore, we're allowed to wear it even out into the public domain. It said in the Mishnah, that a woman can go out with a pepper in her mouth or with a, a, a piece of salt in her mouth. So the Gemara says, The reason why you might want to put pepper in your mouth is because of bad breath. It ameliorates the bad breath. And the, the salt was for an ailing tooth. If somebody had a certain kind of tooth condition, a problem with their teeth, sometimes the prescription would be to put a piece of salt on the tooth. So it wasn't considered carrying because, again, just like the bad breath is considered a medical condition, you're not considered to be carrying that pepper in your mouth. It's considered to be treating a problem. So, so too, the salt on the tooth is considered to be treating a problem and not considered to be a carry. Similarly, anything else that she puts in her mouth, the Mishnah said, and what are examples of this? Zangvila, ginger. Inami dartsona, which Rashi says means... Cinnamon. So there were other things that people would put in their mouths in order to uh, ameliorate bad breath uh, or, or if for refua purposes in order to heal the conditions of the teeth or the gums or whatever it might be. These things are not considered a masoi. They're not considered a uh, burden that's being carried, but they're considered something which is, uh, in a way, you could say um, enhancing or treating the body. In one way or another, so they're not considered to be carried. Yes. You put it before Shabbat. Well, right. It said that you had to put it up, right. You had to apply it before Shabbat. Otherwise, it looks like you're just use, you're using it as a way to carry. So if you put a piece of ginger in your mouth, you got to sleep with it. It's got to be stuck on the tooth. In other words, the point is that they would stick this on their tooth, or they would no, stick this on. Ginger for bad breath. Right. The, the, it would have to be there from before. Right. Otherwise, it looks like you're just carrying it. Shen totevet shen shel zahav. It said a false tooth or a tooth of gold. And then you had a machlok between the Chachamim and Rebi, Rebi Matir, the Chachamim Osrin, that Rebi said it was a, you're allowed to wear the gold tooth, and the Chachamim said you're not. Amar Rebi Zerah, Rebi Zerah said, Lo shenu el shel zahav vav shel kesev, debrei kol mutar, that we only taught this machloket with regard to a gold tooth, but a silver tooth, or a tooth that blends in, that's just a plain tooth, false tooth, that you can go out with. And the concern is a gold tooth because a gold tooth, the person will say, hey, look at my gold tooth, everyone. Look how wealthy I am, right? Like we said yesterday. <laughs> so the, um, so the, uh, the concern is for a gold tooth, but you have a silver tooth or you have just a, a white uh, piece that's in there that's serving as a, a dentures of some sort, that is not going to be a concern because nobody's going to take that out to show their friend. Tanya and Amiyachi, we similarly learned in a bright tab, shall kesef tibre kol mutar. Everybody agrees when it's made of silver because that blends in with the other teeth and it's nothing special. Shall, and it's, it's not as fancy. Shall zahav, ribi matir, vachachamim osrim. But when it comes to a gold tooth, ribi, rabbinu akadosh, allowed you to wear it out. He said a person is not going to remove their loose tooth in, you know, their false tooth in the middle of the street. But the Chachamim said, since it is something fancy and it shows your status, it shows your wealth, there's a concern you might take it out and carry it. Amar Abayabai said, Rebiv Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, Kolos Viralu, the Chol Mideh, the Megan Yabe, La Atyal Achuyeh. They all agree, these Chachamim, Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, they all agree that anything which is a disgrace to you, we're not concerned you're going to show it off and come to carry it. Where do we see this principle? Rabbi had the Amaran, because Rabbi is the one that we see. You're, you lost your tooth. Now you have a gold tooth in there. You're not going to want to pluck it out and be like, hey, everybody, look at my gold tooth, because it's going to show that you're missing a tooth. And that's not something that, you, that reflects positively on you. Rabbi, uh, similarly, Rabbi Eliezer, we learned about Rabbi Eliezer earlier. That Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, poter What was the reason why Rabbi Eliezer allowed the woman to go out wearing the bundle of spices or wearing the balsam oil around her neck? Because the reason why a woman would wear that was because she had a bad body odor. Nobody's going to want to say, hey, look at my great uh, herbs that I wear because of my body odor. Because it reflects poorly on her. So again, uh, the same principle. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar Tanya and Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar similarly. As he said, Klal Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar because Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar said in the Brayta, Kol Shu Lemata Mina Sevacha Yotz Abo Lemala Mina Sevacha Ina Yotz Abo. As we said earlier, a couple of Tapim ago, that according to Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, anything that's under the hairnet is okay because you're not going to take the hair covering off in the public domain to show it. 
anything on top of the hairnet, according to Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, that's where these are the takshitim, these are the uh, ornaments that a woman is not allowed to wear, because since they're on top of the hairnet, they are easily removable, and she can show them around, and she can carry them. Something underneath, she's not going to want to open, uncover her hair in order to get to it, because it would look bad, it would be immodest, and therefore, um, we're not concerned that she's going to do that. In other words, when the showing off is itself going to reflect poorly on you, it's not really showing off anymore, is it? That's the concept here. And so that's what these Chachamim are arguing. They say that we only make a Gzerah on showing off when it's an item that the, show, the process of showing off doesn't itself reflect poorly. So yeah, you might have a great balsam oil jar, but you don't want to point out the fact that you have bad body odor. Uh, you, you might have a really nice gold tooth, but you don't want to point out the fact that you haven't been brushing or flossing and so on. So the same concept over here. So whereas the Chachamim say if the item itself is worthy of showing... You're not allowed to wear it out. These Chachamim look at it in a, a, a broader context and say, if the showing off is itself going to point out something negative about you, perhaps you're not going to want to do it. Like, hey, look at this really great chain I got in jail. Or something like that. You know, a person doesn't want to show off that they were in prison, you know, because it looks negative. So even though it might be true that it's a beautiful chain. Now, now we come to the next Mishnah. Yotza basela shala tzinit. This was, a, as we're going to see, a coin that they would put on the bottom of, if they had an, a bruise or some kind of a sore on the bottom of their foot, they would take a coin and put it on their foot. I think that they, there aren't there some uh, old time people that still do something with a coin to, when there's a, people have different kinds of uh, wounds or pain that they put a coin on it. I think it's, it's old time medicine. The people from the old country, they, they do that. So they, they would put it on the bottom of their foot. Habanot ketanot yotzot b'chotin. Fafila b'kisavinch b'osnehem. We learned about this earlier that they would pierce the ears of the young girls. But instead of having starter earrings like we have today for the little girls to make sure that the hole doesn't close up, um, they would put a string through the hole or they would put a little wood chip through the hole to make sure that the hole didn't close up before she had a chance to get some nice jewelry to put in. So uh, they're allowed to wear these because they will not remove them. Arviot. Arab woman, women, but this is talking about Jewish Arabs. In other words, women who are living, Jewish women who are living in Arab countries and wear veils. So Yotzot Re'ulot, they can go out wearing a veil on Shabbat, no problem. Because uh, these are not, the, because in that culture, you will not remove the veil. If the culture, in that culture where you, uh, you have to wear a veil out, you're not going to, apparently they had this dress code even back then, um, they, you're not allowed to remove it. And in fact, in Shira Shirim where it says, Libavtini be'achat me'enaich. Why does it say you made me excited with one of your eyes? Because they used to cover one of their eyes. They would just have one eye covered in many places in the Middle East. It's true. Um, so, uh, so, and it says, Umadayot, uh, women who live in Madai, Jewish women, obviously, we're talking about, because women who are uh, non Jewish people from Madai don't really care about the laws of El Chot Shabbat. Um, we're talking about women who are Jewish living there. So they can go out. Perofot, which is what we're going to see. Perofot means that what they would do is they would have a cloak that they would put around them. And the cloak would have a strap on one side and a bulge on the other side. And what you would do is, let's say you would take like a rock and you would, you would, so you would put the cloak around you and when you would take like a rock and wrap it on one side of the cloak and make a bulge. And then there was a strap on the other side that would wrap around that. So you almost made a button you could think of it as like, it's almost like you made a button using a nut or a rock or something from, that would create a bulge under the cloak and then you would attach it to the other end of the cloak. The other end of the cloak would, would wrap around that. You made like a, there would be like almost like a makeshift buttonhole on one side and a makeshift button that you created with a nut under the cloak on the other side. And that's how you would hold it together. So you're allowed to do that. Uh, and this is really true about any person. It just happens to be that mostly only Arab women go out with veils. And mostly only uh, women in Madai would go out with this type of cloak. But any person is allowed to do it because it's something which is considered clothing that won't be removed in the public domain. That was on right at the beginning of Islam, I think. That was right. I guess that there were people who did it even before that because the Mishnah was written before Islam. Was, yeah. So uh, apparently they had this cultural practice even before. The, yeah, Arabs obviously did. Yeah. So poreft ala even v'ala egoz v'ala matbeah. So she can make this button in her cloak that we're saying that she would insert. <laughs> so she would put the cloak around. Imagine a talit. You put it around you, and you would put a coin in one side, right? And it would make like a bulge, and then you would tie it around it. So what if it falls out? Yeah. So we're, we're, we'll see. We'll see. So apparently it was very tightly done. 
but you can use a rock, you can use a peanut or nut, you can use a coin. But you can't do it, you can't make it on Shabbat. We're going to see that the, the Gemara is going to say that's only referring to one case. That's only referring to the case of the coin, because a coin is muktzeh. So you're not allowed to make this kind of, a, you're not allowed to fasten the, the garment in this way on Shabbat. But the other ones, the nut and the rock, if you set it aside from before Shabbat to be used for this, it would be okay. So that's, that's where we're, we're, the conclusion of the Mishnah. And now we're going to see <coughs> the Gemara. So the Gemara says as follows, My tzinit, what did you mean, tzinit? You said you can put, you, you can go out with a coin on the tzinit. What is that? So he says, bat ara, the daughter of the ground. So what does it mean? It means, so Rashi explains what it means is, on the bottom of the foot, which touches the ground, is a wound, and they would tie a coin around the foot, holding the coin to the bottom of the foot, and somehow that would help to heal the wound. Why do you have to use a coin? Maybe you'll tell me it's because of the hardness of the coin. So then, So why don't you use a piece of earthenware? Why do you have to use a coin? So so you're going to tell me it's because the, the metal kind of sweats a little bit. You know, it, 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 it has a property to it that, um, it, you know, that it, it provides a type of moisture that, uh, that, that that's what's going to heal the foot. And that's why you had to use metal. But if that's the case, then just give her a plate of metal. Why does it have to be a coin? Maybe you're going to tell me it's because the form imprinted on the coin somehow helps for the healing to take place. So la so make her out of wood, some little piece with a picture on it. Why does it have to be a coin? Amara. He, just said, he just said metal. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're rejecting each one. They're saying if it was, if it's the sweat, if it's the fact that it's hard, get something else hard. No, but he Why said, does it have to be a coin? But he gave him a ring. So he said, no, it's because of metal, because right. it sweats. He says, well, if that's the case, just make a bar of metal. Why does it have to be a coin? Right. Oh, so it must be. It must be then because of the the form on the coin, not oh, because so of the metal itself. Kind of he's trying all the different possibilities. Okay. So right. Amara Baye Shema Mina Kulo Malinla. Actually, the answer is that all three of these things are the reason. That's why it's a coin. It's it's hard, it's metal, and it's got a form. So the three, the three aspects are all necessary, and that's why they chose a coin rather than something else. It's not metal, it's silver usually. Silver, right, probably, yeah. And it's probably the chemical but that goes on. That goes on, right. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that in folk medicine, it's still something that they use sometimes. Yeah. So, we said that the girls can go out wearing strings. Avod de Shmuel, lo shavik lehu lebenate de nafke b'chutin. Velo shavik lehu ganyan gabe hadade. Vavid lehu mikvaot biyome nisan. Umapatze biyome tishre. So, he, there were several things that the father of Shmuel did in connection with his daughters. What were these things? Well, first of all, he didn't allow them to go out with the strings in their ears. Even though it says in the Mishnah that they're allowed to, he didn't allow them to do it. We'll see why. We're going to see an explanation for all these things. The second thing was he didn't allow them to sleep together in the same bed. The third thing that he didn't allow them to, the third thing that he did was rather than let them go to the river to do tevila, to immerse uh, during the uh, spring months, he would make them mikvaot at home. Okay, they're on mikvaot at home. Um, Mapatze biyomei Tishrei means that during Tishrei, when the river was very muddy, he would make them sort of mats that they would step on when they would go to the river to immerse. Because they would immerse in the river during Tishrei, just not during the sun. So then he would make them mats to go under their feet because otherwise their feet would get stuck in the mud and they wouldn't do a proper immersion. That's what, that's what Rashi says. Tosafot says that the purpose of that Rabbeinu Tam explained that the purpose of these mats wasn't to go under their feet, but was to be put up as a mechitza, so people wouldn't see them go to the river. But either way, he would let them go to the river during Tishrei, just not during Yisan. And we're going to see an explanation for all of these things. So first of all, he didn't allow them to go out with strings in their ears. Didn't he read the Mishnah? The Mishnah says, that the girls were allowed to go out with strings in their ears. We're not concerned they're going to pluck them out. The problem was that Shmuel's sisters, okay, the daughters of the father of Shmuel, in other words, Shmuel's sisters, had very beautiful colored strings that they used. And therefore, because they were beautiful and colored, there was a chance. They didn't just serve a practical purpose. They were actually decorative, like earrings. And that was why he didn't allow them to go out because he was afraid that they would take them out of their ears and show them to their friends. 
He didn't allow them to sleep in the same bed, even though they were all girls. So the answer, so lema misayale le ravuna. Maybe this supports ravuna. Da'amar ravuna nashima misolilot zo bazo pesulot. As we turn to Amud Bet, la kiona. Is that like what Rav Huna says? We know that the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry anybody but a virgin. And anybody who has had uh, you know, any relations at all will, will be disqualified. So do we, is the reason why? Because the, the, he was concerned about lesbian activity going on between these girls under the, under the covers. You know, he was, this is, you see, it's very, yeah, and, and, and that would count as not being a virgin if there's ever a Kohen Gadol who wants to marry them. Now it's very interesting. How open the Gemara, the Talmud is much more open about sexuality than modern, you know, than religious people of the 20th century or 21st century that we're living in now. Then, you know, and it's, you know, he wasn't, the, the Gemara wasn't embarrassed to suggest or, you know, to talk about these issues. And when we get to Masechet Kiddushin and things like that, we see that they're very, very uh, direct and straightforward about discussing these issues. And it's, ha- it's a hang up that we get from our uh, non Jewish influences and culture to have hang ups about talking about sexuality. First reference to, to female. Well, it's mentioned elsewhere. It's mentioned elsewhere. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the concern is that is that the reason? Because Rav Huna says that lesbian activity is actually also considered sexual activity, and therefore they would be pesulot lekehuna. Is that the reason? No, that, that's not the reason. Savar ki echid lo lelfan gufa nachra'a. That he's, he was concerned that they not get used to sleeping next to another person because that might make them seek a man prematurely. Okay, not necessarily that he was concerned that they would be engaged in sexual activity with one another, but that he was concerned that it might awaken a desire to have a partner in their bed, and then they'll get into other trouble. And that was why he didn't allow them. And he would make them a mikveh in the spring months. What's the reason? Why only the spring months? So the reason is because This follows what Rav said. Rav mitra that if there was rain in the West, meaning in Israel, if there was rain, you could tell from the Euphrates River, from the pra- Nahar Prat. They would see in Babylonia the river passing through, and they would notice that it was full of water, and that would mean that it had rains in the mountains of Israel during the early spring and, and the winter. Uh, because they, would, they could see from the river. The river was overflowing, and that was a good thing. They would be happy for the... Um, for the people in Israel, Savar Shelo Yirbu and Notfin al Zochalin, and the concern was that the Notfin should not overpower the Zochalin. So this was what Sammy had difficulty understanding in the first shiur today. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to re- reprise this. So uh, the answer is like this: that there are two types of mikveh that are valid according to halacha. The first one is Ma'im Chaim. You can have Zochalin. You can have a flowing river, like it says about the Zav. The Zav has to go Ma'im Chaim. Now, flowing water is one type of mikveh that's, that is acceptable. The, uh, like, the other type of, of uh, water that's acceptable is a mikveh, which is contained water that doesn't move. Okay? Yeah, Either, right, so that's, well, that's separate, that's separate. That's how we do the mikveh oh, today. But first, just think in two categories. You have, let's say you have just a cistern in your backyard that collects rainwater. And the rainwater just sits in there, okay? You have, a, you have a, a hole in your backyard. So that is standing water. Standing water is good for a mikveh. Or flowing water in its natural state. If you have a river that's flowing, in its natural state it flows, that's okay. What you can't have is water that is rainwater flowing. Because rainwater is only good for a mikveh when it's contained River water is good for a mikveh when it's flowing. But, but rain water that's flowing is no good. So for example, if you decided that you wanted to make the mikveh into a jacuzzi, you know, and put in, you know, those air ducts that make it flow and make waves in the, that's no good. The mikveh has to be standing still water. The, the river can be flowing. So what's the concern? During the spring, the winter has passed, and that rushing river that you see, a lot of it is rainwater. That's the rainwater rushing. So now you have rainwater, but instead of the rainwater being contained, the rainwater is moving, and it's Zohalin now. That's no good. So he said, therefore, what did he do? He made a pit in his backyard that would collect the rainwater, and that rainwater was now standing still, and that's where they would go. But during Tishrei, by the time you come to Tishrei, the rain water that was flowing in the river is gone already, because it's been the summertime now, and so that river water that you see is purely river water. 
and it's flowing, but that's okay for river water. That's just not okay for rainwater. Rainwater has to be collected. Upligad Shmuel, and this is a machloket with Shmuel. Amar Shmuel narami kipei mivrich. That according to uh, Shmuel, narami kipei mivrach means that that the that the river collects uh, its ble- is blessed from its own power. In other words, from its from its own source. So Shmuel said, yeah, this, the, uh, from the under from from under the water from from the ground. So according to Shmuel, we're not concerned that a river is overflowing as a result of the rain. We look at the river as having its own source of water. But actually, Shmuel contradicted himself because in another case, because actually Shmuel himself said that you can only go into a flowing river if you're dealing with the Euphrates River in Tishrei. So actually, Shmuel didn't contradict what we're saying here. He agreed with what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, most of what Tosafot is saying is rejecting another interpretation of the Gemara that both Rashi and Tosafot reject. But the... um, but the, the, the point here is that in the end even Shmuel agrees that you can go to the river for a mikveh during the springtime because what you're going into is really rainwater that's flowing and isn't contained. So you can only go to the river during, the, during, the, during Tishrei when the river water that's flowing is river water and river water is allowed to flow. Rainwater is not allowed to flow. So, so it said you can make this makeshift button in your cloak by putting a rock and squeezing the rock in there and then tying the other end of the cloak around the rock. You're allowed to do that. So va'amrat resha porefet. Why did you tell me porefet in the beginning of the Mishnah, but then you told me you're not allowed to do it on Shabbat? Amar sefat on the matbea. The only case when you're not allowed to do it on Shabbat is when you're using a coin because the coin is muktzeh. But if you have a rock that's set aside for making this button or anything else, you're allowed to. So now the Gemara asks the question. Abaye Abaye asks the following question. Let's say you, a mother has a little boy. The little boy wants to bring uh, a toy with him, or it's talking about a nut, whatever it is, a toy, let's say in a modern terms, to, a, to synagogue on Shabbat. There's no, air, there's no way to carry it. So what's she going to do? She puts, the, she puts the toy in her cloak to make this button. She squeezes it in there. She ties the strap around on the other side. Sounds right? Yeah. So, and then she walks. So is, the, uh, is she using that as a button? Yeah, it's functioning as a button, but her real intention is a trick. She doesn't really want to wear this cloak. She's only doing it to transport this item, which is a nut in this case, for the boy. So what do we do? So Tibai Lemanda Amar Marimin, Tibai Lemanda Amar in Marimin. So this is a reference to a later sugya about Shabbat, where we where a fire on Shabbat, and the parameters of taking things out of a house when there's a fire on Shabbat, where we where the, the there's a uh, an opinion that says that what you can do is you you have a limit on what you're allowed to save from a house that's on fire on Shabbat because we're worried that you might put out the fire. But once I said ma'arimin, which means you can put on 50 layers of clothing, put on 10 sweaters and walk out, and 10 pairs of pants, no problem. We know that you are really doing it because you want to save the clothing and carry it outside. But ma'arimin, don't say anything, just do it, you're saving it. The other one says, ain ma'arimin, since we know the only reason you're wearing it like that is because you don't usually wear 10 sweaters, do you? Not usually. But you're doing it because you want to remove it from the house, so you're not allowed to do that. So the Gemara says, according to either way, we have a question here. Because, Because even if you say by the fire that you're allowed to put on 10 layers of clothing and save the clothing, still, over here, you might say you can't. Because over there, if we don't allow you to play a trick and put multiple layers of clothing on, you might end up just extinguishing the fire. And we don't want that to happen. But here, if we tell the woman you cannot use the nut to make the button in your cloak, she just won't bring it. She'll say, okay, it's not an emergency. It's not a feeling of urgency. Okay, I can't bring the nut. Fine, I can't bring the nut. So we can't necessarily, even if we say by the fire that you're allowed to put on extra clothing, and trick, play a trick on the system, so to speak. Find a loophole in order to do it. We can't necessarily say that the woman would be allowed to do that because it's a different story. 
Um, and similarly, similarly, Odilma marimin badlika. And even if you say that you're not allowed to do it with the fire, that you're not allowed to put on multiple uh, layers of clothing, still hatam That's because it's like a type of carrying. To wear something on your back is a type of carrying. But here, it's not really a way of carrying. A person doesn't normally carry a nut in his cloak tied as a button. So therefore, you might say that our case is more lenient. Take one, we can't resolve it. So, and it because a clo- because Rashi says that a, a merchant might wear a lot of clothing on him to carry it out to the shuk. If he doesn't have, want to carry, if he can't carry boxes or whatever, that's a way to transport it. So it's a normal way to transport clothing is to wear it on you to transport it. You know, I actually had a so so wait so I just want to I just wanted to, to, to summarize the, the point here so so the, so the woman is putting the nut as a as a button. We know her real intention is to transport the nut, so we can't infer from the case of clothing wearing extra clothing on Shabbat to save it from a fire. Because even if you say that you're allowed to save clothing from a fire by wearing extra layers, we might say that's only because of the sense of urgency. And here, this isn't urgent. On, uh, uh, there we're worried she's going to put the fire out. Here we don't have that concern. On the other hand, even if you are not allowed to wear extra layers of clothing and save it from a fire, that could be because we look at wearing those extra layers of clothing as a normal way of carrying clothing that you're doing to save the clothing. But here, it's not a normal way of carrying a nut to make it into a button in your cloak. It's, no, it's a normal way of wearing the cloak, but it's not a normal way of carrying a button, so you, or carrying a nut. So therefore, one might argue that our case would be even more lenient than the case of saving the clothes from the fire. And therefore, take a, we say we don't know the answer, and that's why the halakha is brought, the khumra is brought as a stringency that you cannot make, you can't take an item that's a, that you want to carry in a makeshift way and utilize it as a button in your cloak in order to transport it on Shabbat because we don't allow harama. We don't allow a person to utilize a loophole to sort of play a trick, hiding their true intention to transport an item on Shabbat.